Thank you for the University of Nostra and uh, thank you for creating this very interesting program. Um, it's quite an honor for me to speak here, the more so because I'm so often being asked to speak about the anthropology of Islam. And whenever I'm asked to speak about the anthropology of Islam, I ended up sort of questioning that for various reasons. And now I'm for the first time actually to call to ask, talk about uh, secular ideology. So I think it's a recognition of my work being visible more than just one thing. And of course Islam is more about more than just one thing, just like secularity is. Um, I will start with a little poem, uh, or a line from a poem, because I titled this uh, presentation of mine, Those Who Said No. And it, I borrowed that from a poet uh, from Egypt, uh, Amad Rungur, who write, begins a poem of his, I'll read it in Arabic and then in translation. al majdu is shaitan ma'bud al-riyah. Man qala la fi wajhi man qala na'am. Man alam al-insan tamziq al-adam. Man qala la falam yamud. U dhala ruhan abadiyat al-adam. It uh, it is called, the poem is called Last Words of Spartacus, and Spartacus is speaking while being, getting hanged at the end of his revolutionary career, and he's, he begins, Glory to Satan, God of the winds, who said no in the face of those who said yes, who thought humans the reaping of uh, nothingness, who said no, did not die, but remained a forever tormented soul. And the poem continues, and you can actually find it in translation of the internet if you want to read the entire poem. It's a very interesting one because it is a very rebellious, revolutionary poem that thinks about what does it mean to reject power. And it does not arrive at an optimistic conclusion at all. It rather thinks about rejection as a torment, and something that actually even the hero of the poem would not wish to his own son. And I think that if we are to share something like uh, secular ideology in the Arab world, I think poetry is a good place to start with. And I think Amal Dunku is actually one of the poets from Egypt whose uh, poetry has been widely cited in the course of the revolutionary uprising. This particular line has been around a lot in the last uh, president, at last uh, constitutional referendum by people who wanted to vote no. And it tells of a certain understanding of uh, these people that they are fighting a struggle that might be futile and they might be losing, but they're doing it anyway. So these are the people I want to talk about today. I tried to make sort of an ethnographic uh, theory of, uh, of a group of people in Egypt. Here are some of them. Um, who have uh, established themselves as uh, quite a powerful political actor or a powerful political group um, in the social scene and the political scene, uh, simply mostly known as revolutionaries. Uh, now in Egypt, uh, of course, after the revolution, almost any political power claims to be a revolutionary power including even people from the old system, and everybody claims to be speaking in the name of revolution. But there is one particular group which quite consistently describes itself as Suwar, the revolutionaries, and is quite often actually also described as such by others. Not exactly by their opponents, but people who are more distant from politics, they describe that these are the Suwar. And here you see them, you, it's mostly young. Okay, we have quite a lot of light here, so we don't see much of the details, but it is a crowd of young people, some women, mostly men, um, different haircuts, different looks. Uh, it's an urban, uh, largely bourgeois uh, audience, uh, middle class, not necessarily the poorest of the poor, and definitely very young. And it's also that's uh, often called in some studies the youth, which is partly also something which these people identify themselves as. Although some of them can be quite old, just as there are a lot of young people who are not among them. But let, let's think about more about the category of revolutionaries, because I think that is something that uh, emerges as a political identification parallel with those that we are mostly dealing with in the academic and political discussion, which are liberal, which didn't exist in Egypt before, but has in the last two years suddenly become a political concept. 
very close to the American usage of liberal, which is different from European. Uh, left, which has a longer history, and secular, but usually not the word Almaty, but uh, secular, a different sense of uh, secular, which is called in English Madani, which is civil. Civil means it's neither theocracy nor military. It's a sort of idea of civil rule of the state that is based on democratic institutions. And I, um, I know quite a few of these people from uh, two places in Alexandria, where this picture has been uh, taken, 25th of January this year, and in a village in the northern Nile Delta, where a group of men, um, about 20, 30, 40 in number, tried to win the revolution in their village and have ever since been struggling. And uh, I think that, uh, I, and actually, when I was asked to give this talk, I then went to ask a number of these people, say, no, uh, do you think of yourself as leftist? Or do you think of yourself as secular? Would you describe yourself as liberal? And they gave me quite a lot of interesting answers. And I will get into these answers, but I will first start with, start with a sort of little um, ethnographic description of what kind of people we're talking about here. As I said, this is the first image, this is the second image. Um, we're talking about here, especially in urban context, about mainly young people, mainly highly educated, um, often uh, quite uh, cosmopolitan in their orientation, however, not necessarily. There are some poor people there, there are people with very basic education, but there is a something like an almost like a shared habitus. If you join the revolutionaries, it's not just uh, that you have an opinion, but that you develop a certain social circle, how to meet certain people. Some of this revolutionary movement is very internationally connected. Uh, here you actually see people who have adopted black bloc tactics from uh, from the autonomous left of Europe and Northern America, which uh, for the first time emerged in the uh, demonstrations in Egypt uh, just this January. And this is, uh, I mean, I know somebody whose son is, was est establishing the Black Bloc, and this guy was in a private school, speaks very good English, so he's able to actually communicate with people internationally, and uh, therefore also to import uh, certain uh, tactics of confrontation with the police to the Egyptian streets. It's been the big, big fuss in the Egyptian media. The black, everybody's been talking about Black Bloc, and it has brought quite some jokes because uh, the, a law was passed which could also be uh, applied at as women wearing a cup, which is because they are wearing black and covering their faces. However, there is another ethnographic scene which is not as cosmopolitan, not as uh, bourgeois, not as uh, urban, definitely not urban, because they are on the countryside. And this is a group I have uh, been following, which were friends of mine with whom I was already doing field work before, and uh, they are a group of leftist, mostly young men in a village who had, some of them had been in the cities participating in demonstrations during the revolution in 2011, and when they come back, came back to the village and then they were on holiday because they lived uh, in the cities, they came together and started doing a lot of uh, actions. And uh, these people are generally much poorer, definitely not, uh, very few of them speak good English. Uh, some of them live in the cities. Many of them are friends or well connected also with the political scene in Alexandria. But uh, you would uh, here speak more of a sort of lower rural middle class people who have a certain degree of uh, Education and much more important, perhaps, than class here is that these people stand in often in the family history of communists in this in this area, which in the 70s and 80s had important uh, activity of the communist party. As far as I know, there is only one person among the young generation who would actually describe himself as a communist. But uh, the sort of uh, generation of communist fathers and uncles is really influential, but it is interesting to think about in what sense they are influential, because Marxist Leninism today is no longer something that people would be specifically into. So these people um, were not part of an, any political movement. They did not join a party. They were not an organization. Actually, they are totally disorganized, which is why they have been able to do some, uh, I jump this one, some, uh, some actions in specific situations when they had lots of energy. This is shortly after the revolution when they organized three cleanup campaigns, which was a very popular thing to do in Egypt. Um, in March, they organized a public meeting with the mayor of the village where they wanted to discuss issues of local politics. 
and such as cleanliness, uh, bread, uh, sales of bread, electricity, electricity bills. And they had very high ideas of actually changing local politics and changing public awareness and turning the village society into a democratic society where people would be aware of their rights and their possibilities. And they failed. This particular meeting ended in total chaos and none of the decisions that were made were ever implemented. And uh, most of the people were highly frustrated about uh, the, 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 the sort of resistance of most people to their idea of how to change the world. And um, uh, also about their own ability to do something. Now, after that, they've been doing some a lot of things occasionally. They were there were lots of many of the same people were informed you know, participating in the Hamdin Sabah presidential campaign. They've been doing political extras every once in a while. But what they do most of the time is sit together, talk, uh, meet in the cafe, and uh, talk, and talk, <laughs> and um, and it's actually something of value. So these are the, these people. I ask them. What do they actually believe in? And uh, do they see themselves as leftist or secular? And I'll give you just a short overview of some answers I got. One person, a uh, math teacher, said that uh, while he does see himself as a leftist, and actually most of the people in his circle he would describe themselves as leftist, except for one who insists that he's liberal, not leftist. He said that nevertheless, this is not the crucial issue. What is a crucial issue is, he says, that we want the good of the country and that we think for ourselves. And here he distinguishes himself from the sort of corrupt system Mubarak, which is, does not want the good of the country, and from the Islamists who, in his view, do not think for themselves but take orders from their leaders. Another younger man, uh, still a student, says, essentially, yes, I could describe myself as leftist, but that's I could also describe myself as liberal, and I think Abdel Nasser was okay. What matters is that I want change. And um, another uh, guy continued on that and said, you know, what I really want is a neutral state. And now here came to a sort of, and then came in a sort of secularist movement. So this guy very much articulated critique of Islamist politics and said, I want a state that doesn't distinguish between a church and a mosque and a nightclub. And um, that's what, which uh, I would say on any measure kind of counts as a secular, <laughs> a secular <laughs> position, you know, no matter whose definition you take. And the uh, other guy insisted then more on a sort of vision that uh, this kind of neutrality should be placed on knowledge, on science, on, uh, on the primacy of knowledge over religion, although when I then sort of confronted them with evolutionary theory, they said, yeah, come, and they didn't uh, feel so comfortable about that anymore, and in that moment actually went to search for what they used to say, compromises that uh, result in a harmonious vision. So by no means anti-religious. Actually, most of these people are, especially in the countryside, are very religious. And some of the people who one month see, see in a cafe telling very irreverent jokes and uh, developing very strange religious ideas at the same time have a dark spot on the head which one gets from praying regularly on carpets made from bad materials so that one gets uh, skin irritation here. And uh, so uh, definitely not secular in the sense of not being religious. In the cities it's different. In the cities in these sort of more urban uh, middle class uh, revolutionary circles there are people who are genuinely not religious. But uh, otherwise, um, there is not really much of a positive ideology. Actually, one other person put it most clearly when I asked her, which says, said, I'm against the bad and I'm against the worst. I'm against the old system and I'm against the Muslim Brotherhood. And I said, uh, yeah, but what are you in support of? And then he got much more vague and ended up saying, that, you know, I'd like to see somebody like Abdel Nasser who cared about the poor people. And I said, well, would you see yourself as a socialist? Yes. And I think there we get to the point, these people would, if asked, describe themselves as socialists or leftists. Some of them are liberal. The, if, when speaking about the relationship of Islamic political movements, they would definitely be secular, but these are not the defining factors of being a revolutionary. Actually, they are Islamist revolutionaries. I met one guy in Cairo, who was a hardcore revolutionary going to Tahrir on every occasion, 
And his closest political sympathies were with the jihadists who were fighting a war against Israel in Egypt in the Sinai. And so there is something else, and I think it is perhaps very well phrased in the beginning by Amal Bukhul in his poetry, is that what carries uh, this kind of revolutionary attitude is not so much a positive ideology than an affect of rejection, a principled attitude of critique and difference. Um, and it is actually celebrated as something is very much that these people think of themselves of being what actually is an organization of failure, which is that these people are totally individualistic. It is almost impossible to get any kind of organization uh, running, or if you get it, it starts splitting and it doesn't work. This organizational failure is very much celebrated actually as a moral value because people say, we are the people who think for ourselves, we do not take orders from anyone. Of course, they are doing some quite some injustice to Islamists because well, most Islamists are Islamists because they have good reasons for that and they have thought about it for themselves. But uh, this is, however, the sort of selfish person. And I think this rejection is not just a sort of intellectual principle. I think it's very much based on a certain experience. Um, because refusal in the days of the revolution has been really a key liberatory experience. One guy from Cairo, who comes from the same village, but he lives in Cairo, described to me his first demonstration on the 28th of uh, January 2011 as the first day that he felt that he was a human being because he went out and he said, or said very loud, no. And then went home and uh, spoke on the phone with his uh, fiancé, which also was an additional important part. Um, but here, I mean, the, the sense of freedom here, it's important that it's connected with love. And I get to that. It's, uh, there is a sense of liberation through rejection. That the very ability to reject, to open the reject, is a liberating act. And it's very much shared as an experience of many meaningful action in the culture of protest. Uh, this is again 21st of January in Alexandria, where uh, the demonstration very quickly developed into clashes with the police force, and the police force was shooting huge amounts of tear gas. And um, people have a very, people in the cities who regularly go to demonstrations <coughs> have a kind of strange relationship with tear gas. It's very unpleasant. I mean, tear gas is a terrible thing and makes you cough and feel very bad, and especially if you get lots of exposure to it, you often feel bodily ill for several days. At the same time, people make jokes about it and say, we have become addicted, then addicted to it. I'll go and get a, get a sip of gas. And I think it has to do with the fact that this kind of cultural protest has become the most important sense of meaningful action that a certain group of people in Egypt have learned. And they learn to do it really well. And that's why they're also really bad at anything else, uh, sort of such as winning elections. And they, lots of people want to boycott the next elections. Uh, but they will be able to make some good uh, demonstrations. Um, but I mean, you know, it would be easy to sort of take, make a pragmatic critique of this kind of uh, love for class struggle, tear gas, rather than pragmatic politics. But I think uh, to, let's not be so critical, it's to uh, think about what is its experiential value. And I think if we get down to the sort of grain of the things, I think there is a strong underlying faith in this kind of politics of rejection in freedom. So if you want to call it in any sense, uh, uh, ideological sense, I would say that this sort of being a revolutionary Egypt uh, is libertarian. Libertarian in the sense that it prioritizes freedom as not only a demand, but as an experience. It's political freedom, personal freedom, cultural freedom, <coughs> religious freedom. Uh, this is the sort of, I would say, the sort of, um, not necessarily ideological, but emotional undercurrent, of course, in the framework of a conservative society, of a very conservative society. People are not there to talk about uh, freedom uh, to be gay, for example. Uh, this uh, is not an issue that would make people want to go to street, but I think it's because the demand for freedom is articulated from the background of a religious conservative society, and it's directed at a specific unfreedom which people experience. And uh, so these specific unfreedoms have to do with the police, they have to do with gender, they have to do with expressions of aromas, they have to do with religious uh, discourse. Um, so, yes, so, yeah, in a way, we would say being revolutionary in most cases is secularia, although not always, it's left, not always. Um, 
Secular is, in a sense, also that it's very busy with religion. It is not secular in the sense that it wouldn't care about religion. Actually, people are very busy with religious symbolism, with religious ideas. There is a very big cult of martyrdom, which is a very religious idea, even if it's translated into a nationalist one. Um, the vast majority of people have a strong underlying religious faith. And they're also quite busy to claim their own sense of religiosity, which I think is a big change in the last two or three years. Ever since that there's an Islamic, uh, Islamist power ruling Egypt, being uh, religious and being oppositional, standing in a different relationship. Under the Mubarak era, these two things went much better hand in hand. Now, if you're oppositional, you have to also make conscious statements about religion in a way not before. Uh, and uh, and finally, I would like to say about what does it actually accomplish? What does this kind of revolutionary movement accomplish? I would say that there is a strongly tragic side to it. I don't think that uh, Egypt's uh, radical revolutionary movement will be gaining power in these elections or actually in any others. In fact, they have a strong insistence on purity, on legitimacy, and there is a very distant anti-pragmatic attitude in, uh, in this whole uh, movement of, of being revolutionary. As I said, there is again talk about election boycott. And there will probably be lots of people working in there. And then the party that will suffer from that is their own. Um, however, there is, I think, a more fundamental tragic side to this sort of, sort of being revolutionary, which is that the way, and I think here they really showed a strong affinity with the new left in the West is that what characterizes being revolutionary is an attitude of critique and difference, and it comes along with a certain lifestyle. It comes along with certain clothes, certain looks. The kufeya is, for example, has become a very sort of fashionable article of being revolutionary. And um, it, it, it results uh, in people articulating a discourse in the name of the people. The, it's typical, you know, you have this uh, a sharp, you read this khat in Muslim, the people demand down with the system, which has become a standard phrase all over the Arab world. And in Egypt, it takes 10 people together anywhere, and then they will say, a sharp, you read, the people demand. But actually, when we see what these uh, people in these revolutionary circles articulate, is actually quite anti people, in the sense that they are actually quite a lot in war with society. They actually are const constantly busy critiquing, questioning, problematizing the state of their society. And in that sense, uh, they, at the same time, have a very strong attraction towards a lot of young people who have a desire for difference, for critique. But it also makes it for them very difficult to convince and to win over people who do not share this desire for difference and critique. And this is related to, I think, what is probably their greatest weakness, and quite contrary to what we think in the base of news media, is the gender issue, which is that revolutionary, the revolutionaries need to have huge problems in winning over women. Um, in, we have, of course, in news media we very often see women in protests, and there are in the cities always a number of women. And, of course, photographers prefer to photograph women in a protest, so the photographic material that we get is overwhelmingly showing women and men. I think you're probably the percentage, even in Alexandria and in, uh, in Cairo, of leftist secular demonstration of women is 20%, and if that's 20% is good, that's a good result. If there is violence, uh, then it goes quickly down to 10%. But there is a group of more mainly young women who are very sort of committed even to uh, clashes and riots, and they, are, they can be seen at every demonstration. So in Alexandria and Cairo, you have a group, a group of mainly young, some older women who are very much part of a sort of activist, street activist movement. But there are fewer than men, and it is much more difficult for a woman to go for this kind of risky trajectory. There are all kinds of issues of respectability, of worry, of allowing to go uh, stay out or stay out late at night, or family control, which makes it uh, difficult even in the sort of liberal big cities for women to participate in these movements. And in the villages, it's a real problem. I was speaking with the same guy whom I quoted before about being against the bad and against the wars. And he had been an election obs obs observer at the constitutional referendum. Am I very late in time? Okay. He had been an observer at the constitutional referendum and described different groups of people who came to vote. 
and they have made a big campaign. Um, they have made a big campaign uh, to vote no in the constitutional referendum. One of the traces of this campaign in the village are graffiti all over the village here, which says "Down with the rule of the Supreme Guide." Supreme Guide being the leader of the Muslim Brotherhood, who is considered to be the real president of Egypt. And they made a big campaign, and he was an observer at the, at the, at the polling station. And the village people basically know who votes what, and people go and vote, and they tell what they vote. So he was very interested to see who votes what. And he said that the essential, and in the, the final result in this village was 35% yes, 74% no. Which was actually a very good result for the opposition, because the nationwide result was 46% yes. But, uh, so for countryside this was good, but they, these guys were very unhappy because they didn't make it a majority and because they said they lost the female vote. That the female vote was overwhelmingly yes for the constitution, which was the position of the Muslim Brotherhood. And, uh, he's, and he said, our problem is we don't have any girls. We look at ours. I mean, I'll, I'll get back to the story and I lose some scrolling. So, all the pictures that have women in, the, in this series are from Alexandria. Here are the guys in Alexandria. Guys, 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 guys. Um, and it has to do with gender segregation and uh, gender roles in a village society. In a village society, uh, like this is a fisherman's village, it has a lively public life. There's lots of cafes, much more cafes with farmers' services. And fishermen have a long history of political opposition. This uh, sort of livelihood of fishermen is then again related to the role of the Communist Party in the 60s, 70s, 80s. And there is lots of cafes, which is a very important place for leftist politics in the worldwide, interestingly. And in the Egyptian countryside, only men sit in cafes. Women never, ever go to cafes. And um, they, their, their whole existence is based on a social life of staying in people's guest rooms, of going out in cafes, hanging around late at night, which in a rural society is definitely men's thing to do. And there are actually some revolutionary women in the village, but they invariably come from leftist families. So they're revolutionary because they're either born into or married into revolutionary families. And uh, um, it is further than that, the very idea of uh, rejection, of saying no, is something that is difficult for everybody, but much more difficult for women than men. It is a much more revolutionary thing to say no as a woman than as a man. And here comes a sort of a very paradoxical social isolation of this group is that they are able to cross gender boundaries only in those social situations where gender boundaries can already be crossed, which is very much the urban uh, middle class media where there are spaces for that. Where those spaces do not exist, they lose the battle to the Muslim Brotherhood who are able to send female members of their organization to people's families and uh, talk to them and win them over in a way which these guys cannot. Um, so, so much about the difficulties. However, I would say that uh, looking at the situation in the village in particular, where we have this group of, let's say, between 20 and, 20 and 40 young men and some older men who are describe themselves as revolutionaries, get active in certain occasions, sometimes go to participate in, uh, in demonstrations in the cities. They clearly failed in their dream of transforming society quickly and uh, convincing people of their point of view. And probably their point of view is one which by nature is a minoritarian one because it is based on difference, based on being critical. However, they have become uh, something that is quite powerful because they are developing into what I would call a moral opposition, a role that until 2011 the Islamists held. The role of those who question, who have high moral principles, who uh, draw into question the principle of the functioning of the state. And this can be seen in, uh, in the proliferation of graffiti. Um, as uh, uh, until 2011, there was uh, regular and plenty of uh, graffiti by the Muslim Brotherhood, which was usually about either about headscarves or about Jerusalem. And uh, they have basically stopped making graffiti, strangely enough and uh, left the walls over to the revolutionaries who have now started to dominate the walls with their graffiti 
And the graffiti, uh, of course, doesn't change the world, but it is telling of a shift of who, whose voice is that voice of questioning and demanding a critique. And uh, let me get to a sort of, um, and it's of course the democratic side of this because it is very often a losing battle as so it becomes a struggle as a value for itself. But um, I want to come back to the issue of, um, of ideology, if I have a um, is because I think there was a time when this village had an ideological left. There were active communist party cells who actually read Marx and Lenin, and they were Marxists and Leninists, and they would even understood what it means to be Marxist. Their sons and daughters rarely have read even Lenin, not to mention Bernard Marx. And they are very ecumenical, ideologically. And they seem to share something which is perhaps not an ideology, but what uh, what Raymond Williams has called a structure of feeling. Williams' uh, idea was that the structure of feeling is something that precedes an ideology, a sort of gut feeling that there is something wrong, and that there must be something right, a certain uh, normative understanding of wrongs and rights in a society that is, however, not developed into a detailed plan of action, not developed into an organization, not developed into a programmatic manifesto. And I think that's why poetry is perhaps the more likely space where such things can be expressed than actual, uh, in actual ideolo ideological uh, writing. The other thing is, uh, I think, um, rather than ideology, what we're talking about here is something that people see as greater than life. And I think it is a key to ideology. It's something that I come to theorize in relation to religion and then uh, have realized that actually people think about revolution at times in a logic that is not dissimilar to the logic of religion. The idea that it is something greater, it is something greater than we and our immediate struggle and what we experience uh, what we do is all complicated in all kinds of ways, and we might be revolutionaries, but actually we don't have the energy to get up in the morning. And uh, tomorrow there is a demonstration, but everybody just talks about it the next morning, and they say, oh, we call each other the next morning, and the next morning nothing happens. And yet, you don't lose faith in revolution, you might lose faith in your own ability to do that. And revolution becomes something like a what I call a grand scheme, a great idea that people posit as existing uh, above and over ordinary life and therefore remi remains uh, unaffected. But of course, if revolution itself then becomes the guiding idea, then there is something strange with the idea of change. Because then we are not talking about positive change in the sense of having steps, I want to realize this and realize this and realize this, I want to have a revolution in order to do this. No, revolution itself becomes the aim, and I think this is perhaps part of an emerging split and development among the Egyptian revolutionary movement between what is developing into a pragmatic opposition movement that one day might actually gain power in Egypt, and into a radical movement that, much like the radical left that emerged from 1968 in Europe, will never be power as a movement, never gain power as a movement, but will become a more like a cultural, intellectual breeding ground for a certain kind of critical attitudes that have social relevance in a more complex way by bringing certain kinds of trajectories of life histories and by being something like a theory factory if we think about how much of 1968 ideology has in the end come into power in the Western world although their revolution failed in political terms, I think that perhaps is an occasion for a more hopeful ending than Amal Dunkul would have given to the question about what happens to those who say no. Thank you.